day. Amen. Amen. I know um, when we celebrate Father's Day and Mother's Day, a lot of us are sad. We think about fathers that have passed, mothers that have passed. Some of us have things that are going on in our lives where we don't see our father or mother, but today's a great day. Because today is the day of the Lord. The Bible says, I love it. This is the day that the Lord has made. And I will rejoice in what? To be glad in it. Amen. Look at your neighbor and smile. Just tell him, you're going to be glad. Amen. And now don't tell them it with a, with a frown on your face. They don't believe you, all right? <laughs> You're going to be glad. This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Whatever you're feeling right now, God's got something in store for you. Amen? Amen. His presence is here. If His presence is here, then God's going to move in a mighty way. Every time we step into the presence of God, He's going to change us. Amen? He's going to turn us from what we used to be into something new. To be more like Him, the Father. All we have to do is seek Him. The more I seek Him, the more I... And you know, when I, when I first heard that song... This don't have anything to do with my message, but it's okay. Uh, when I first heard that song, you know what I began to think about? It, it sounds kind of funny. The more I seek Him, the more I find Him. And, and a lot of people say, yeah, well, if I seek something for long enough, I'll find it. But you know what the great thing about it is? Every time I seek God, He does something new in my life. And the more He does something new in my life, the more I see the love that He has for me. And when I see the love that He has for me, the more love I have. I love him because he first loved me. Amen. And we have to realize that. This morning, I'm excited. We're starting our new series, Take the Land. If you have your Bibles, turn to Psalms 37, 1 through 5. If you don't, it'll be on the screen. It's in the bulletin also. And I'm excited about this series. Uh, we'll be going on for today and next week. And then we'll have Vacation Bible School, so we'll take a little break. Um, and, and we'll do some cool stuff for Vacation Bible School. And then we'll have uh, 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 four weeks in, uh, or three weeks in July where we'll finish up this series. And then we'll have Children's Day. So we'll be going great over the next couple of months. The Bible says, fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. For they shall soon be cut down like the grass, and withered as the green herb. Trust in the Lord, and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee desires of thy heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him. And he shall bring it, bring it to pass. Today, as I said, it's Father's Day 2017. And we start our new series, Take the Land. And during this series, we'll be looking at the book of Joshua. But before we do that, I wanted to look at what it means to take the land. You see, taking the land is not only referred to Israel entering the promised land, but believers entering into the fullness of what God has for them. You see, a lot of times I believe that, listen, church, it is great to be saved, amen. Salvation will do what? It will get you into heaven, amen. It will get you a relationship with God. But do you realize God wants more than just that? He wants to do more to you than just that. Listen, he didn't die on the cross just for us to be saved. He died on the cross so we could have everlasting life. And a lot of us need to realize what everlasting life is all about. Some of us think that's when we get to heaven, but no, man, it's from here right on this earth. Do you realize you can have everlasting life here? Some of us need to step into the promises of God. Amen. Do you realize that God has promised you things? Amen. Some of you can't even see past your difficulties to see the promise. Oh, good Lord. Amen. <laughs> Some of us woke up this morning and we had a bad morning. And we can't even see what God's doing because we we so worried about our circumstance. Amen. And worried about the promise of God. Amen. We're so worried about everything else than worried about the promise of God. Do you realize God has got great promises for us? And all we got to do is take the land, step 
you. But that does mean God promised victory, church, and victory is on its way. We love the song, Victory is Mine. Amen. We, we, behind, amen. we even do the little thumb. You know what I'm saying? I told the devil, get thee behind. Victory today is mine. Amen. Right. Some of us say it, victory is mine. Victory is mine. Told him to get behind. <laughs> Listen, church, you got to start claiming your victory. Amen. Yeah. God's got a victory in your life. Amen. And listen, some of you might not see it, but it's coming, amen. If it's not here on this earth, it's going to be in heaven. You just keep walking with him. Keep holding on to his hand. Keep holding on to the promises that he's given us. The problem is, we don't even know what the word says because we don't get in it. I just looked at you for that. Happy Father's Day. We got to get into the word. Realize the promises that God has. In each and every one of our lives. Joshua understood that if you ever wanted to get what God had promised you, then there are things you had to do. There's things you had to go through. And there's some characteristics that you have to have, have to develop to reach the promises of God. Which leads us to Psalm 37. You see, Psalms 37 is a teaching psalm. It was written by David, who had been anointed king as a teenager, but spent the better part of his 20s running from the ungodly king Saul. David, the one that was anointed to be king, the one that defeated Goliath, the man that nobody thought could be defeated, he defeated Goliath. He spent most of his 20s running from a king. Do you realize in those times, in, in his 20s, he had time to kill Saul. He had time to do things to Saul. But you know what he did? He realized that God still had plans. God still had a plan. Some of you have been dealing with sickness for so long, you feel like it's defeated you. But God still has a plan. Every time you go to the doctor, you want to hear them say that you're healed. But every time you go, they say, no, you're not healed yet. Take this medicine. Do this thing. Do that thing. But you know what? Praise be to God. God still has a plan. The giant hadn't failed yet, but God's got something greater in store than just healing you of your sickness. He's got a testimony in your heart. He's got something living inside of you. He's already promised that victory. He's already promised that defeat. He's already promised that healing. And church, you've got to realize that God still has a plan. Amen. 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 Still has a plan. Young people, I know, the world's rough. It's unfair. we got to work. Amen. we got these seniors all the time telling us that we don't know what we're doing. Amen. Amen. We want to sleep all the time. Amen. Amen. Some of us seniors want to sleep all the time. Amen. <laughs> The world's rough. I love it because when I look at how rough the world is and how bad the world is, you know what I see that as an opportunity for God. Yes. Do you realize your biggest obstacle is the biggest opportunity in your life? I learned that. David understood that, so he wrote this song. <laughs> As an old man, David wrote Psalms 37 to share his insight on this problem. The Psalms reflects the wisdom he had gained from years of walking with God. And in Psalm 37, there are six references to taking, dwelling in, or inheriting the land. Psalms 37.3 says this, dwell in the land. Keep going. Psalms 37.9, they shall inherit the earth. Psalms 37.11, the meek shall inherit the earth. Uh, Psalms 37.22, those blessed by him shall inherit the earth. Psalms 37.29, the righteousness shall inherit the land. And in Psalms 37.34, he shall exalt you to inherit the land. I think Jesus was trying to tell us something, right? Amen. Yeah. Has your mom ever told you to do something twice? You know that second time, you better get ready. Amen. <laughs> my dad only had to tell me once, but my mom had to tell me multiple times. My dad just looked at me and I go, oh, yes, yes, sir. <laughs> my mom, she had to tell me three or four times. I knew by that fourth time, you better get it done. You're going to be in some big trouble. Amen. <laughs> He's telling us six times to inherit the land, to take the land, to dwell in the land. Church, God is trying to tell us we need to start dwelling in the promises of God, in the presence of God. Stop taking the way out. Stop looking at how hard it is. Start dwelling in the presence of God. Take the land. Amen. Take the land. He understood this. He understood what it meant to take the land and the promises of God. 
teaches us how to take the land God has for us. There are two things that we should not do. There are five things that we should do if we're going to enter into the fullness of God. And this morning I want to look at them. The first thing is, fret not. Amen. Fret not. I love this because the word fret means this. It means to be in a worried state. Another definition says to call emotional strain, to be vexed or worried, an action of wearing away, an agitation of the mind. Church, when we are anxious or worried, we cause ourselves emotional strain and, and start to wear away spiritually, emotionally, mentally, and physically. Have you understood that? Is there something you're worried about? Don't show your hands. I'm just going to raise my hand because I don't worry about all kinds of stuff. Amen. My wife, she, she knows I worry about everything, baby. I worry about some dumb stuff, too. Some dumb stuff. It'll start raining outside, and I think my tree's going to fall through my house. Worry about that every time it starts raining. Amen. I don't know why, because most trees fall after the rainstorm. I don't even know why I'm worried about it. I worry if there's a tornado in Oklahoma that it's going to hit us. Amen. If there's a hurricane in Mexico, <laughs> somehow it's going to turn and you turn and, and go through all the other places and hit Williamson, South Carolina and tear us all down. Amen. I worry that as I'm walking down the street, somebody's going to jump me. I don't know why. I just had those thoughts. If I'm in a big place, I'm like, where are these people at? Amen. I try to find the exit door, so if I have to run, I know where it's at. Amen. I don't want to be one of those people that are running around and can't find the door. Amen. I just running around like a chicken my head cut off because I couldn't not even know where the door was at. So everywhere I go, I make sure I find the door. Amen. But do you realize that when you start worrying, it starts breaking you down? Do you realize when you start being scared of something, it breaks you down? It breaks you down emotionally. It breaks. Amen. We so emotional because we so worried about so much stuff. That's the reason why we, we don't even like to go out and do anything anymore. We're scared of what people's going to say if we tell them about Jesus. It breaks us down. And you know what finally happens? It breaks us down spiritually. Do you realize that? I love what Jesus said. Because a lot of people think, I, the, the disciples came up to Jesus and said, what do we eat? What do we drink? You know what Jesus said? Look at the birds. <laughs> Some of them probably thought he was a hippie, amen. Look at the birds. Look at the trees. Look at the grass. If I will take care of the bird and the grass that don't have a living soul, then why would he take the one that was made out of his own image? That's right. Fret not. Fret not. Listen, if you're going to take the land, you better not be scared. Amen. You better not be scared because, listen, there's things out there. And I love it because if you look at Numbers 13, Moses sends in spies to the land of Canaan before they went out there. And ten of the spies tells them, yes, the land is flowing with milk and honey, but we can't go in there. You know the reason why we can't go in there? Because there's giants in there. You realize because they were scared, they missed out for a long time on the promises of God. Some of us get so scared, sometimes we miss out on the promises of God. Ten of the twelve spies came back and told them we shouldn't go. You see, they spent too much time being scared over the giants instead of God's power and ability to enable them to enter the land and experience victory over its inhabitants, which God had already promised them. How many times do we do the same thing? We look at what's coming against us and we run instead of following God's power to overcome it. The Bible helps us with some scripture, Isaiah 41 and 10. And I love this scripture. It says, fear thou not, for I am with thee. Amen. Amen. George right here, I know, man, if I'm with him, I ain't got to worry about somebody talking to me. I think I know him well enough, he'll protect me. Amen. Amen. I have to worry about him getting him, but not me. Amen. Listen, we get to a point that we need to realize that God is with us. Yes. 
I love the scripture. It says, perfect love does what? Cast out all fear. Perfect love cast out all fear. That should just change your life right there. If you have Jesus in your heart, perfect love cast out all fear. He says, I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. Listen, I love my God because he stands up and he says, I am the God. I am the one that's in control. I am the creator. I am the king of kings. I am the Lord of lords. I'm the one that created the thing that's coming after you. And because I created it, I have all authority over it. And if I want to, I can say, sit down, Satan. And guess what he'll do? He'll sit down. I will strengthen thee. I will help thee. I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Somebody need to write that scripture down. Christ. Fear not. I am with thee. I will change your life. I'll be with you, but he don't stop there. Because look at 2 Timothy 1 and 7. For God had not given us a spirit of fear, but of what? Power. And of love and of a sound mind. He don't give you that spirit of fear. That's on your own. You know what fear is? Fear is something that tries to keep you away from God. But my God says, I don't give you that spirit because I am with thee. I give you a spirit of power, of love, and of sound mind. Church, when you get afraid and, and you come to that, uh, that situation, you say, My God has given me power, He's given me love, He's given me a sound mind. I've been trying to tell myself this because it's, I'm afraid of amusement park rides. And my wife wants to go to Carowinds um, with some friends. And if it was just me and my wife, it wouldn't be that big a deal because I let her ride and I just sit on a little park bench and watch it. Because I don't have to act all big and bad for her. I'm already married to her. Amen. I'll go buy her a necklace or something. Amen. But she's talking about taking some friends with us. Amen. I can't be the one sitting on the park bench while everybody else is riding. Amen. And as I was reading the scripture, I'm going to go up to the roller coaster and I'm going to say, listen, God is not giving me the spirit of fear. I have power over it. When you go to the doctor and you're worried about what they're going to say, say, God is not giving me the spirit of fear. He's not giving me the spirit of fear. He is with me. He upholds me. He strengthens me. But he doesn't stop there. Look at this next scripture. Go ahead, Pastor Jeff, and turn to the next one. I love it so great. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication have thanksgiving. Let your requests be known, made known unto God. You see, when you're afraid, if you come to God, you let him know, and you thank him for being on your side, and make your, your requests known to him, he will uplift you. Change your life forever. We cannot be afraid. We cannot be afraid. The second thing he tells us is we cannot be envious. <coughs> Psalms 37 and 1 tells us not to be afraid, and he tells us not to be envious. Do you realize that envy and jealousy will destroy you? Do you ever realize that? You know how I know that Proverbs 27 4 says this wrath is cruel and anger is outra outrageous, but who is able to stand before envy? Being envy of someone destroys any thought of reaching what God has promised us. You know what you're doing when you're envy and jealous of somebody? You're trying to reach their promises and not yours. You ever thought about that? Stop trying to reach other people's promises. We, amen. I'm glad you're sitting here. We get jealous of other churches sometimes because of what they have. But you know what? God has given us everything that we need right here. As people, we get jealous of what other people have. We get jealous of that so-and-so is not sick, so-and-so is not financially troubled, so-and-so is not this, but we forget that they're going through something also. And we don't want that part. We just want what the good things they have. Listen, church, stop being jealous of other people. Look at this 
next scripture, and I love this next scripture, because it says in James 3.16, for where envy and strife is there a confusion in every evil work. And then what happens is, when we have that envy in our heart, it flows to our tongue. And James 3 and 6 says this, and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity, so is the tongue among our members, that it defiles the whole body, and set it on fire that course of nature, and it sets on fire of heaven. Envy usually starts simple, but then it escalates. Then it escalates. Church, we can't be envious. The third thing we must do is we must trust God. You see, all through the Bible we see people that left everything to trust the Lord. Have you left everything to trust the Lord? Have you left completely everything in your life to trust the Lord? you left your reputation to the side? Do you realize all through the Bible we see that the disciples, they left their lifestyles, they left their families, they left everything so they could follow Jesus. Abraham almost actually sacrificed his son because he trusted in the Lord. He trusted in the Lord so much. Peter trusted in the Lord so much, he jumped over the boat to walk on the water just because Jesus said, come on. God to do something amazing in your life. Have you? Amen. I, I love those prayers where we pray to God to do something and we don't believe He's going to do it. Lord, heal me, but I know I'm sick. Lord, help me financially, but I know I'm still struggling. When you pray something, you better trust in it. Amen. Trust in what you're praying. Trust in God. Trust that his promise will come true. Listen, God has never lied. God is always faithful. God has never uh, uh, forsaked you. So tr trust in him. After we, after we trust God, the Bible says do good. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 says this, For by grace we are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, least any man should boast. You see, grace saves you, but once grace saves you, then you've got to change your lifestyle and do the works that God calls you to do. Some of us has not reached our promised land because we can't even open up this book. Amen. Some of us have... Reach financial freedom because we can't even give back to God. Amen. Some of us are having relationship issues, but we can't even go to God and pray for each other. You see, when God saves you, then you have to do what God calls you to do. Amen. Stop talking like a Christian and start acting like one. Amen. That's hard. It's rough for me to say, but you know what? I don't need to see your Christian shirt to realize that you're a Christian. I just need to see how you act. I don't need to see your suit to see that you're a Christian. I just need to see how you act. Even in the bad days. Amen. Anyway. You ever woke up in the morning? If it's like me, you walk through the house, you're stepping on the Lego, the kids won't wake up, the shower's cold because everybody else has used the hot water, the, the toaster don't work, so the pop tart's cold, and, and you're out of milk, you're out of Sprite, you're out of everything. You get, you get in your car, and you ain't got no gas, the flat tire on the side, you just had a bad day. And then the first person that comes to you, you know what you do? You let them have it. Amen. <laughs> Can't believe you did this. You know what? People are watching you. How are you going to react? Do good. Do good, the Bible says. Do good. Titus 2 and 14 says this, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and, and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. 1 Corinthians 15 and 58 says this, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as ye know what your labor is done in vain in the Lord. Galatians 6 and 9, and let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Do the works of God. The fifth thing is, we've got to be faithful. 
Faithful in the hard times. Faithful. Listen, in church, being faithful starts in the good times. Starts in the good times. You be faithful in the good times, then God will be faithful in the bad times, and you'll realize how you need to be faithful in the bad times. Let me keep going. I know we're running out of time. The next thing that Psalms 37 tells us is take delight in the Lord. Take delight in the Lord. Church, we need to have an attitude of delight instead of dread. We need to run to the Lord instead of away from Him. We need to develop a hunger and thirst for Him. And the only way we can do that is we take pleasure in the Lord. Psalms 34 and 8 says this, Oh, taste and see what the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusts in Him. And the last thing we need to do is commit ourselves to the Lord. I want to tell you the story that I heard. Alexander the Great was on his final conquest. His scouts told him about one city he had to conquer. And, and if this conquest was to be successful, it was a small city. And it, and it was built with high walls and surrounded by three cliffs, approximately 100 feet high. He left for the city with 100 of his personal guards. Approaching the city, he demanded his surrender. From the top of the walls, the king responded, saying that we are well, uh, we, we are well ready and had enough provision to withstand an attack for months if necessary. Alexander said nothing, but he motioned to his guards. Immediately, the hundred of them, single file, lined up towards the cliff. He gave the signal. And they started jumping off the cliff. One by one, they jumped off the cliff. When he got to 99, there was one guy left. And about this time, the man stood up, the king of the other city stood up and says, I see how committed you are. So you know what? We surrender. Do you realize when people see that you're committed to God, when the enemy sees that you're committed to God, the devil will flee you. The Bible says resist the devil and he'll do what? He'll flee. I learned this very quickly. Me and Pastor Jeff, Sister Sherry, Sister Nicole, Elijah Brooklyn, I already had this sermon prepared and yesterday we went to the land Filled of fuzzy creatures. It was filled with popcorn, and cotton candy, and ice. It was a land of promises, of fun, and a bunch of children. But when we went in, you know what? My wife, being the great wife that she was being, had a meet and greet with the fuzzy giants. If you know my son, my son is afraid of fuzzy giants. As we walk in, and you can ask Pastor Jeff this, and Sister Nicole, and my wife's done trying to forget it. My son started panicking. Now, we were in a line full of people, and my son is screaming, and he even had this little motion. This is how you know he was afraid. Hold up, hold up, hold up. He didn't want mommy to hold him, but he went to daddy, father. And as I was holding him, I began to tell him, don't be afraid. This is going to be fun. This is going to be great. This is going to be a place where you're just going to enjoy it and have all this great time. So we go down to the room and look at this picture. We were afraid. I don't know if Elmo and Grover was afraid or if me and Elijah, I was talking to him, and I was saying, son, this is going to be fun. Let's just take a picture. I will hold you. I will hold you tight. I went to put him down. He started crying. I picked him up, and I was holding him. I said, just, let's just take a picture. Me and my wife, my wife started saying, let's just leave, you know, and all those kinds of things. And I'm like, no, we're going to take a picture. So we'll get behind him. As I held my son tight, and I began to talk to him and tell him not to be afraid, I began to trust in his father. Because his father had it in his arms. He began to listen to me. He began to not be afraid, not to, not to be jealous of what everybody else is going on. Brooklyn and Jeff 
Kevin to call my brother was just running around. Yeah, you know? <laughs> and Jeff was sitting there like, yeah, you know. <laughs> and, and, and I was like, man, my son's a winner. You know, I don't know what's going on. But I began talking to him. I began, I began to console him. And I began to hold him. And I'm that. It's so awesome. Go ahead and go to the next picture. Oh. By the time we ended, he was whole hugging Elmo, and then, and then we got done with the land of promises of the great show of the Sesame Street. And he looked at Mommy and Daddy and said, let's go talk to him again. Let's go meet him again. As I was studying, as, I, as this came to my mind this morning, how many times have we went somewhere and we've been so afraid to step into the land of promises that God has in store for us? That we need to realize the Father has got his arms around us. And he's holding us. He's strengthening us. He's putting us in a place of comfort. And he's telling us, do not be afraid. Don't be jealous of anything else. Because listen, there might be fuzzy giants. There might be giants. There might be sicknesses. There might be hard times. There might be problems in your life, but if you just hold on to the Father, hold on to the Father, by the end of the day, you'll hit your land of promise. By the end of the day, the fuzzy giants will be just somebody you hugging. By the end of the day, your sickness will just be something under your foot. By the end of the day, your financial issues will be just your testimony to win hundreds and thousands of people. By the end of the day, your, your problems will be just something that you've passed through. And now you're having the time of your life. Because now, in the promises of God, all you have to do is come to the Lord. You want to take the land? You allow the Father to hold you up. You allow the Father to change your life forever. Church, I'm calling you to take the land. As my wife comes on out. Listen, I knew he was afraid. God knows you're afraid. God knows you're worried. God knows the issues that you're going through, even if they seem small. God understands. He's telling you to trust in Him. Commit to Him. Follow Him. Do good. He'll change your life. You all stand. I'm asking this morning. Take the lamp. Take the lamp. Step into the promises of God. Step into what God has in store for you. Two thousand and two. My life was great. I had the girl of my dreams. I was going to school. I already made plans after I graduated to move somewhere tropical and live there. Thought I was going to make lots of money, and then you know what? I came to church. The worst and best mistake I ever made. The reason why I say it was the worst because you know what? I realized that my plans wasn't by my, the Father's plans. The best mistake I ever made was. When I submitted to the Father, I didn't care about my plans. All I cared about was His. Was I afraid? Yeah. Was I scared? Yeah. Was I jealous of other people? I was jealous of my friends who could go out and do whatever they wanted to do, and they felt nothing. But if I tried to do it, I felt bad about it. I felt bad when I tried to gossip. I felt bad when I tried to lie. Listen, church, I even tried to cuss and felt bad. I felt bad because God came in my life and he 
changed me forever. And you know what I had to do? I give everything over to the Father and said, listen, my life is not my own. To you I belong. I step into the promises you have for me. That same year, there was a revival here at Restoration Chapel with Brother Al B. Wilson. So a lot of you don't know him. He's passed away now. He's in heaven, I know. But he was the type of speaker that everybody's scared of because he would walk out here and he would look at somebody and he'd say, sing! And they would stand up and sing. We ain't never heard those people singing in life and they get up and they sing. He would say, oh, you need to be healed. You need to get prayer for people. And they'd be healed right there on the spot. Well, that Sunday morning, I sat on the front row and I saw how he was calling people out. So that Sunday night, I did what any good Christian would do. I sat in the back row. <laughs> and I slid down in the back of the seat. Afterwards, we go and we eat a meal together. He said, young man, I noticed you were sitting up here and now you're sitting back there. Why are you doing that? And me being hard-headed, I told him, I said, listen, you ain't calling me out. He began to explain about the Spirit of God and the presence of God in his life. And he began telling me, and I said, okay, I'm sitting back up in the front, but you're not calling me out. God had another plan. The next night of revival, Brother George, he grabbed my hand. I love it because he grabbed my hand in the middle of the sermon, and he brought me up. I'm not going to do it to you, baby, but he, because I know, trust me, I was a scared. And for an hour and a half, he preached with me holding his hand. During that hour and a half, I'll never forget, he was preaching about David and how Samuel anointed him three times. And you know what that man, that gentleman did? He took, not this oil right here, he had a bottle of oil. And he anointed me three times to the point that I was dripping oil. Never thought, never knew what that meant. At the end, he prayed for me and he said, Listen, God's got something in store for you. 2004 years ago, God asked me to take over Restoration Chapel as your pastor. That same year, I was preaching about Elisha and how you pour into empty jars and empty jars and empty jars. And I had some oil and I had a container. And about this time, there was young men just like right now that was sitting right here. And I told them, come on. And as I had that jar, one looked at me and said, please don't pour that on me. You know what? God hit me so hard to now. He said, listen, do you remember what happened to you about 10 years ago? I called you to a promise, and now you're fulfilling that promise. Church, I'm telling you this to tell you that, not to brag on me, but I'm telling you this to tell you, step into the land that God is trying to give you. How do you do that? You come into the arms of Jesus. He has a plan. He has a purpose. With every head bowed, with every eye closed, I ask